It is 8 p.m. and here are our top stories. More snow on the way as another winter storm heads for Denver. We're tracking when the flakes will fall, plus how much we can expect. Recovering from the Marshall Fire was already an uphill battle. A lot of people are anxious. You know, we're all on the clock. Building codes and concern over cost now creating another setback. Seems as though the city is attempting to make costs higher for homeowners to where they can't afford to rebuild. President Biden sending a message to Vladimir Putin. The United States and NATO are not a threat to Russia. And a warning. If Russia proceeds. We will rally the world to oppose its aggression. Guns down at the polls. Democratic lawmakers pushing for polling sites without firearms. We have received a lot of emails saying that we're committing treason and it's punishable by death. And this DIY dad puts a whole new spin on his son's costume. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Well, clear today, but gone tomorrow. A mild night as we take a live look over Denver. And, um, yeah, take a good look because it will be covered in snow by this time tomorrow. <laughs> good evening and thank you so much for watching Denver 7 News on Local 3. I'm Andrew Trujillo. I am Danny New. It is a Denver 7 weather action day. Mm -hmm. Another cold front on the way and moving in tomorrow. And it's expected to bring up to six inches of snow to the front range. And then, as usual, an extra hand fill to the mountains. That's right. So Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson, he's here keeping a close eye on the storm for us. Mike? I'll tell you, it would be a big change for what we had today when temperatures reached the upper 50s to low 60s, even upper 60s down at Trinidad. But it's all going to change quickly tomorrow. Just high clouds right now across Colorado, but we do have a variety of watches and advisories currently affect all the way along the I-25 corridor. Winter storm watch for the Denver area for tomorrow midday through Thursday morning at 5 a.m. Most of the snow will fall tomorrow evening along the front range as this cold front comes our way. So here's the headlines for this storm. Dry roads through tomorrow morning. Uh, snow develops early afternoon. It'll be slick Wednesday night and slick and slow Thursday morning. I'll let you know how much snow to expect in the various neighborhoods around the Front Range coming up in about 15 minutes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Well, rebuilding after the Marshall Fire is easier said than done. Louisville recently adopted some of the most aggressive green building codes in the state, and those rules could be the barrier for rebuilding. Now, tonight, the Louisville City Council has voted to approve an emergency ordinance to cut some of the red tape surrounding zoning regulations. Contact Denver 7th Jacqueline Allen spoke to people who lost everything and say the real battle is just brewing. And it's just like a needle in a haystack. Sifting through what little is left of his Coal Creek home, Chris Fuller is also looking at the bigger picture. I'm kind of girding myself for the, for the battle ahead. The battle to rebuild is just getting started. Many Louisville residents already underinsured worry the city's so-called net zero green building codes will price them out. It is going to be placing, I think, a financial burden. That, that may make the difference in whether some of us can you know, afford to rebuild. Tonight, Louisville is considering removing roadblocks over setbacks and housing footprints. Net zero is the next debate. Nobody should have to choose between uh, an affordable home and an energy efficient home. Councilman Kyle Brown says the city is working with Excel and other partners to fund some of the costs. In a public letter, Governor Polis promised he would promote funding a sustainable and resilient recovery for your community and others in the future. So far, nothing is set in stone. Do you feel that pressure of a ticking clock people need to know? Yes, absolutely. Every day, people are already having to make decisions about whether they can stay or whether they need to find another place. We want to keep them in Louisville. I think my biggest concern right now is that the city has an agenda. Christian Dino is a Louisville architect and general contractor who lost his home. He believes the city's net zero requirements could add up to $100,000 to a rebuild. It seems as though the city is attempting to make costs higher uh, for homeowners to where they can't afford to rebuild. He and many neighbors are pushing to return the building codes to 2018 standards for fire victims, still sifting through their options. For, for those of us who are having to rebuild, not because we chose to, but because we have to, I think that's a practical thing to do. Jacqueline Allen, Denver 7. Thank you, Jacqueline. There are clearly a lot of moving parts. For example, Councilman Brown said that some insurance companies may cover the new code, so repealing it would actually hurt fire victims. 
We are still waiting to hear exactly how much the state will cover, but Louisville plans to vote on this in a couple of weeks. Families whose homes were destroyed are not the only ones who were displaced by the Marshall Fire. Several communities surrounding the main fire zone were damaged by the smoke and ash, and now they can get help from Boulder County. Those who qualify could receive $2,500 for a household up to two people and 5,000 for a household of three or more people. You will need to show proof that you've been displaced due to the smoke and ash contamination. Tonight, Superior opened an assistance center to help businesses impacted by the fire. The center will have free work and meeting spaces, plus access to computers, internet, and other office supplies. You can find it in the Superior Marketplace off Highway 36 and McCaslin. Meanwhile, Boulder County has reopened the Colton Trailhead, which had been closed since the fire. Repairs have been made to signs and trails, but working on replacing the fencing is still ongoing. President Biden has a new warning to Russia about invading Ukraine. He says Russian troops are continuing to build near Ukraine's border, even as Russian officials say they are pulling back some of their forces. If Russia attacks Ukraine, it will be met with overwhelming international condemnation. The world will not forget that Russia chose needless death and destruction. President Biden also reiterated his support for Ukraine and warned of fallout here at home. I will not pretend this will be painless. We are taking active steps to alleviate the pressure on our own energy markets and offset raising prices. And I'll work with Congress on additional measures to help protect consumers and address the impact of prices at the pump. President Biden ended with an appeal for diplomacy, saying he wants to reach a peaceful resolution with Russia. Colorado is one step closer to banning the open carry of guns near polling sites. Denver 7 political reporter Megan Lopez explains the new bill aiming to stop voter intimidation and that while some lawmakers say it's a matter of safety, it of course comes with some debate. Both men were on both sides. They set up camera. It's not something Arapahoe County clerk and recorder Joan Lopez is likely to forget anytime soon. A gentleman in a tactical vest, a camera and open carrying. On the eve of the 2020 election at this ballot box on Prince Street, right as people were dropping off their votes, two men showed up. One set up a camera here on one side and the other side and they continued to film voters. The men walked up to the front of the building and just stood there. The police were called, they spoke to the men, but here's the thing. They weren't breaking any electioneering laws. Right now, Colorado law says you're not allowed to electioneer a campaign within 100 feet of a ballot box, but it doesn't say anything really when it comes to carrying a firearm around these ballot boxes, particularly when people are dropping their votes off. A handful of jurisdictions have taken it upon themselves to come up with their own rules, but for the most part, most counties follow state law. What we saw in the 2020 elections just put a spotlight on how sensitive voting has become, and that's unfortunate. That's why Representative Jennifer Bacon and a group of Democratic lawmakers have proposed a bill to ban open carry around ballot boxes and polling places. We want to reinforce the notion of how sacred it is to be able to vote, how um, important it is that people feel safe. I think that is a very valid argument. House Bill 1086, otherwise known as the Vote Without Fear Act, is not without opposition. I don't like to be in gun-free zones. Representative Patrick Neville was at Columbine in 19. And lost classmates. He says this bill could have the opposite effect on some voters. It is going to make guys like me fearful. And that might be what they're attempting to do is to suppress conservatives from actually turning out to vote. The bill passed its first committee hearing on Monday along party lines. As for Arapahoe County, with or without the bill, they're taking action. It was passed where open carry is not allowed in our buildings any longer. A big change before the 2022 midterm elections. Megan Lopez, Denver 7. Thank you, Megan. And if that bill passes, it would go into effect immediately and anyone open carrying in polling locations could face a $1,000 fine or jail time. Coming up on Denver 7 News at 8, Aurora ready to transform its police force. All of this is about uh, the community and making sure um, that we can build trust between the community. We go one-on-one -on -one with the head of the new agency about their goals for the department. Winter storm watch in effect, big changes coming up in the next 24 hours. Plus one family proving that creative costumes aren't always one size fits all. It makes it memorable for the kids. It makes it memorable for other people that are involved. It makes it memorable for people who come across these kids. 